right, so I'm, I'm Aaron Hyde. I'm the uh, director of Fun Group. Uh, also take on the role of division manager Bruce South. I manage a few states down south for our craft and distilling side of things. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I manage Homebrew and the, uh, the Homebrew division at Breeze. So I joined B Breeze in 2014 as a product line manager for Homebrew. Really just meant that uh, they really needed somebody to, to be managing products and production uh, that were coming out and going into the Homebrew market through our distribution channel. And then I became the director of Homebrew this year. Uh, currently splitting time between an office up in Wisconsin and my uh, home down in New Orleans, moving to the South permanently next month. Um, so I'll be remote down there. Uh, I began at home brewing in 97 at the age of 16. Uh, my dad was a home brewer and uh, I found the complete joy at home brewing in our cellar and read it and I said, I, I want to do this. And uh, so he said, sure, let's, let's, let's do it. So. Um, so learned at homebrew from my dad, who now actually has a little shop in his retirement. Um, and uh, I w I'm a certified brewer, distiller, maltster uh, by the IBD, um, and a certified sister under the JCP beer judge. So uh, stuff that I picked up while I had a homebrew shop, actually down in New Orleans, I had a shop from about 2008 to 2013 for five years, brew stock. And it's still going. I sold it to a couple of employees uh, when I decided I wanted to move on from the homebrew shop thing. So I can definitely relate with everything you guys got going on. Um, I've, uh, I've been there and I've done that. So uh, a little bit of favorites down there just because I wanted to pull the slide up. Um, Aromatic Munich, our aromatic malt, is one of my favorite malts. Uh, I couldn't decide between Pearl and Mosaic for hops. I love the London ESP. Uh, Vienna Lager has got to be my favorite style of beer. And I love Led Zeppelin and the Alabama Shakes. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk through history a bit of Reese because really, like, Reese is, uh, Reese is super popular at Helmbrew. But I mean, there's, there's definitely a story to tell, and it doesn't get told very often because, uh, well, we're not a huge company, and uh, it's hard for us to get, really get our message out there maybe as strong as we want it to be. But you guys do a great job with our products, obviously. Um, this is a market that we've been focused on for a very long time. So we are still family owned. Monica Brees and her son, Craig Brees, uh, are president of the company. So uh, it's uh, 140 years old this year. Started over in Moravia, in Czechoslovakia, with a malt trader by the name of Ignatius Brees. He did what Brewcraft does. He, bought, he sold it to breweries. He then decided to open up his own malting business, primarily to make malted milk, but uh, that was just a, kind of ended up being a side business once the grain got going. Uh, Moravia, as you know, is still one of the highlighted areas of uh, malt growing in the world. Um, so uh, he decided that he was going to relocate his family during a bit of turmoil over in Czechoslovakia. Actually, the malt house got commissioned to like make bullets and uh, things like that. So uh, it got uh, it sort of just got commandeered is the best way to put it. Um, so he decided to move his family over from Czechoslovakia. He started importing malt from Czechoslovakia into the United States. And uh, around the 1950s, he established a relationship with uh, Chilton Malting Company, which had been around since 1901. Chilton Malting Company at the time was just trying to service the large number of breweries in Wisconsin, and it gave farmers a place to bring their grain. They, they, Wisconsin at the time was a large barley growing region, and uh, there were a lot of malt houses and a lot of small breweries in Wisconsin. And uh, Chilton Malt Malting Company uh, was started by just a couple businessmen on a couple hundred thousand dollars, and uh, uh, just uh, formed around sort of a farmer's cooperative. Uh, Eric Brees got involved with buying and selling their malt for them. So he was selling it as Brees Malt coming out of the Chilton Malting Company and selling it all over the country. Uh, in, in fact, he actually started exporting the malt. He was so successful with it. Uh, it's one of the last, and I, I have a little bit of on the malt houses, but I'm just going to bring it up since we're talking about it. It's our original malt house. It does about 50,000 pounds of malt at a time. 
which may sound large at the homebrew level, but it's probably the smallest commercial operating malt house in the United States by a large margin. Um, it actually still has wooden bins, just stacked wood and hand-hewn beams and granite floors, and it's kind of crazy. And most of these things actually may be the last one using wooden bins in the world. Um, most of them explode or burn. Um, so uh, somehow it's still standing. Um, so uh, and I, I'm sorry, the picture is a little hard to see, but this is actually one of the original roasters, and it's just a ball. It's called a K ball, and they used to do 2,000 pound batches at a time. 500 to 800 degrees, dude would stand there and turn this ball. Uh, made some amazing malt, and it was a real pain. We actually stopped using the K balls only a couple decades ago, and literally, you had to stand by a bin of 800 degrees to great malt, pouring out of a, a ball of 2,000 pounds at a time. Um, it was nuts. Uh, we, uh, we'd have people come through there and they would just be like, what the? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very antiquated and old and uh, it's how the German roasters used to do it. Nobody, nobody uses cake balls anymore, but for a while they were very, very popular. So uh, Roger Brees took over in 1971 and um, he was uh, fourth generation after his father Eric died. Um, President Jimmy Carter, seven years later, legalizes home brewing, and Roger's all over it. Um, he is like, this is, this is the market. This is where folks are going to, we're going to build a brewing scene in the United States, and it's going to be home brewers. And so uh, that same year, he's like, I'm going all in. I'm buying Chilton Malton Company. We're going to put in a new roaster. Uh, we're going to really uh, push this to the market. So most of the specialty malt through the 80s was coming out of, uh, locally going into the craft market was coming through uh, Brees. Um, we were one of the few folks that did have a roaster in the United States at the time. I think actually in 1978, the only other company that had a roaster was actually Budweiser. But we know how much they roast malt. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of strange. Um, so, uh, in 1980, uh, Brees became the first uh, malting company to actually sell free ground malt. Uh, so many folks were coming into the industry, and mills were coming over from Germany at $40,000, $50,000 a pop. And we said, hey, we got one of those already, don't worry about it. Um, so, it just made their life a lot easier. Through the 1980s, we started contracting with some food manufacturers of malt said, we want to make malt without sugar in it, with just barley in it, nothing else for the brewing industry, and um, kind of sparked this little uh, brew pub scene of extract brewers through the 1980s. We were selling drums and toasts of extract out to these uh, extract brew pubs that started popping up all over the place, and then it trickled down into homebrew uh, shortly after. We didn't have a canister line at the time, so we actually needed to uh, do that out of house as well. So in 1990, Instagrains was commissioned, and that's how you get all your flake products from us, Instagrains uh, plant. There's a new plant that's actually being built right now. If there's one thing that we're at capacity on, it's actually our flakes. Um, we sell a lot of flakes to both the food and brewing industry. Um, we hit the wall last year and just said we need to build another plant. Um, so in 1995, uh, we also added another malt house down in Waterloo, Wisconsin. This is an old Miller Coors malt house. Uh, there uh, was one of their smallest, so they got rid of it, and it was one of their oldest, so they got rid of it. It did pass through Stroh's hands at one point as well. Um, Stroh Brewing, if I guess most people. With them. Sometimes I'm talking to a younger crowd and everybody's like, what? <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so 1995, uh, that, that malt house does about 200,000 pound batches at a time. Again, it's not a big malt house. It may actually be the second smallest malt house, commercial malt house in the United States. Um, so 2001, Roger Brees passed away. His wife, Monica, took over and um, she hired uh, Gordon Lane is COO. Roger Brees is a very hands-on guy. Monica Brees 
uh, not so much, so she hired a few folks to start running the company, uh, a little more hands-on day to day. And uh, one of the first things uh, Gordon did was install a 500 barrel brew house to make all the extract in-house so we could have complete control over the process. Um, that was, the, 2002 is actually the first year we did all of our canisters uh, in-house as well. Uh, so 2003, we started doing business as Grease Malted Ingredients. Uh, had been Grease Industries from 1846 or no, not that long ago, but for a long time, 1876. Um, started introducing gluten-free syrups in 2005. Uh, this was both for the food side and the brew side. And then in 2011, we also started making flowers for the craft distilling market. Um, the, if any of you guys have been to some of the distilleries, a lot of them use flour just to keep, uh, keep uh, their efficiencies very high. Um, and in 2013, uh, this was one of the biggest things that probably happened in our history, uh, was the Wyoming acquisition um, of some grain bins, um, some seed storage, and uh, some, uh, some contracts actually that were in place it had been an Anheuser-Busch facility in an Anheuser-Busch growing region, and uh, they were starting to move out of that area. And we said, hey, we want to go vertically, vertically integrated completely. We want to control our barley supply. We don't want to have to go out on the open mar market and buy whatever crap's available. Um, we said, we, can, we know this region can grow great barley because, well, Anheuser-Busch spent the money to find the best growing regions in the United States. Um, so, we knew that uh, Northwest Wyoming, uh, uh, southern part of Montana, uh, was going to, was one of the best growing regions in the country. So, we pretty much just signed the farmers up and said, you're now Greece employees if you want to be, uh, going to make your life a lot easier because no matter what kind of barley you grow, if it's a bad year, a good year, we'll buy it. And that's very rare for this industry. A lot of these guys have to ditch their malt uh, at feed prices. We're lucky enough to, uh, to be able to do something with that malt no matter what. Um, doesn't mean that bad malt goes into brewing. In fact, uh, none of it goes into brewing at all. Uh, food industry is a little more, uh, a little easier to handle when there's high protein years or uh, high moisture years, that type of thing, as well as the feed market. We actually have our own feed contracts as well that we service. So in 2014, another big purchase, that massive facility there on the right is, uh, is uh, our Manitowoc Malt House that we added in 2014 and have been, uh, in 2015 uh, it was commissioned to run. This was actually the original RAR Malt House. Uh, it didn't quite look like that when RAR had it, but RAR is from Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Willie RAR still runs RAR over in Shakopee, Minnesota. and. Uh, they sold this malt house to Budweiser uh, back in the day, and there's actually six malt houses there. Some of them are so ancient that um, there's still like horse stalls inside, so that horses could pull the, the, the malt around the floor. Um, and there's still a, there's actually still a, a horse barn on premise, and actually it had its own power plant at one point. Uh, it, was the, it was the only municipal power plant for a very long time in the country. It's a 22-acre campus. You can actually pull Lakers, large barges, right up to this thing to an elevator on Lake Michigan, which Budweiser did with a lot of consistency. And uh, we don't do <laughs> because Lakers carry more grain than we need. Um, so we don't use that part of the facility yet. But uh, these are the largest kilns that we own for sure. And uh, although it dwarfs our other two malt houses, it might actually be the third smallest malt house in the world, um, so commercial. So we own the number one, two, and three smallest commercial. I'm not talking about the micro guys, they, uh, they got to beat there. Um, so uh, so we, uh, we definitely uh, added some capacity there. Uh, so in 2015, uh, oddly enough, we became the largest malted milk powder producer in North America. Um, you don't get to taste us in Whoppers or anything, but anything else that's made with molten milk, we probably serve this. 
there was a company making a lot more than us. Uh, they decided to get out of that game, and by default, we became the largest producer in the United States, and uh, people have been scrambling for malted milk. Uh, so, uh, so that was kind of cool. And if you guys ever get the chance, we make some malted milk balls as a handout. And if you ever see me at a homebrewers conference or craft brewers conference or GABF, just hit me up for some malted milk balls sometime there. Awesome. Um, so in 2016, uh, in 2016, uh, we had we were celebrating our 140th anniversary, uh, still family owned to this day. So, just how big is Brees? And I know you can't really read this chart. And there's a little arrow down here. And we're very very proud of this because this list comes out from RAW every year, and uh, we've never made this chart before. <laughs> when we bought Manitou Walk, we made the chart. Um, we're the 24th largest monster in the world. Uh, at, home, at the homebrew level, a lot of people think we're number two, number three. It's not true. We're small. Um, not big at all. Wireman's right above us, actually. Uh, and at the top there is Souffle. Uh, you, I believe you can actually order some Souffle through uh, uh, Brewcraft and Country Malt Group, but for the most part, they are a contracted malt company that uh, sells to the big boys. Um, so yeah, that's uh, just to give it a little perspective there. Any of the green bars are North America. Uh, the orange yellowish bars are uh, Europe. So I'm uh, just gonna talk through sort of just uh, how malt moves through Greece. Uh, Terry and Tyler did a great job talking about the malt process. I was going to throw something like that and they did a great job. If you have any questions you can ask me. I believe Tyler probably is the, the go-to guy for that. He is uh, he's, uh, going to be able to answer any of your questions there. Um, but uh, So this is out in Wyoming in a big horn basin. Uh, high plains. They get about four inches of uh, rain during the year, a uh, growing year, and uh, barley grows very well and very fast there. It's very golden, very plump. Um, there's no staining, it's just, it's ridiculously good looking barley. Um, you'll see that all of our brewer's malt is now made with Wyoming and Montana barley because when we want, when you open a bag, we want it to kind of be like a pot of gold. Uh, it looks really good. Uh, they don't, because of that, they do siphon to irrigate. They're on uh, the Buffalo Bill Reservoir, which has about 120 years worth of water for the region. They're not in a drought or anything like that. They, have ample water. Uh, they do siphon tube irrigation there, which is kind of funny to watch. The dude just walks down the uh, irrigator, sucks in the hose, drops it down. That's what he does. Um, walks back, pulls the hoses out. That's all he does. Uh, it's not automated or anything like that. They they walk the field stuff. So. Uh, so there's harvest. That's actually a picture from last year. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's just uh, we don't get much lodging. We don't get much staining on the barley, it's just bright gold. And it's crazy to see it wet in the germination beds. Sometimes you walk in and you just, you're, you're, you're dumbfounded by how pretty it is. Um, barley delivery during that time goes to our facility out there in Wyoming, which is our seed storage. We do most of our seed storage out there. Of course, we save some seed for the next next year's uh, planting, and uh, the rest gets uh, thrown on rails to Wisconsin. Um, why are there three malt houses in Wisconsin if all of our barley is grown in Wyoming, Montana? It wasn't always the case. Uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, North Dakota grew 90% of the barley for a very long time. Um, it's how Miller's, why Miller's there, and a lot of other big breweries. Um, so they, uh, as the barley moved out, the malt houses are such a pain to uh, build and make money off of that they just stayed where they were. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a hard industry. It's very manufacturing heavy and very agriculturally based. Um, and you can see all the trucks lined up there. When harvest gets rolling, they, uh, they, actually, they actually had to buy acreage to put in loops for the trucks because they line up about 180 at a time. Um, they take them 24 hours a day. Uh, so we get everything fresh right off the field as soon as it's ready to go. And there's our barley storage. And you can see a couple big tanks back there, uh, bins in the back. We actually added two more of those just so we can keep our barley segregated. We grow the varietals we want now 
um, for the bar for the styles of malt that we're making. Um, and uh, right from those bins, it goes on uh, rail cars <coughs> right through the top, and they get uh, sent to Wisconsin. So uh, bar, uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, uh, that's our that largest malt house that we have right on Lake Michigan. Uh, gets railed right into there. There's a, about 178 bins there. Uh, it's a lot of bins. Uh, before we had uh, 32, so uh, we had a really hard time. But it was all it all came down to just uh, having a production schedule planned out for like the next two years. Now we don't have to do that. Um, so um, Waterloo also receives in some barley. They have less bins, but uh, um, they also get a lot of direct shipments from Wyoming. Chilton uh, is uh, one of our key uh, malt houses, even though it's our smallest because it does a lot of our specialty kiln products and it houses two of our roasters um, that are always running 24 hours. Um, so those are steep tanks at Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Uh, Chilton, uh, if I took a picture of it, you'd, you'd probably, if we compare it to you probably last because there's four cement tanks in there and they've got like smiley faces and graffiti on them. Uh, so the, the Manitowoc site is really pretty, just rows of steeping bins. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's quite a sight to see. A little more automated at Manitowoc Chilton. Chilton's hand cranks, literally hand cranks to move barley and everything. And it's, it's pretty nice. So there's our germination bed at Manitowoc and our uh, head maltster, Dave Lukow, who carried over from Anheuser-Busch and uh, was the maltster for Anheuser-Busch and uh, definitely knows his way around a malt house. And uh, there's a kiln being loaded and you can see that uh, the turners haven't passed yet so it just gets dumped gravity vertically right down through the center of the floor in the germination bed, one, uh, one floor down. And then the salad and box has turners slowly turns the malt, it makes a single pass every 24 minutes, and you can barely see the turnips uh, moving. It's very gentle on the malt. Uh, there's our roaster and Chilton. Uh, those get loaded to about 8,000 pounds a piece, uh, and that, we make all of our caramel malt in that. Uh, uh, Terry brought up the caramel crystal difference. We technically could be calling ours a crystal because it's all roasted uh, caramels. Um, much more depth of flavor, some people would argue, uh, than a kiln pr caramel product. And uh, there's our banging line in Chilton, Wisconsin as well. So uh, one of the most unique features of our company and our malt house is actually that we have a 500 barrel brewing system on premise. And this is to make our extract. Um, we are currently the only facility making brewing grade extract, which means no additives, it's just barley. Uh, we don't do, do anything else, really, uh, to make it. Minus maybe adding some enzymes for the rye product or something like that. Um, but uh, otherwise, yeah, it's just a barley product. It's a custom five vessel system. It allows for 24 hour operation. In fact, this thing kind of needs to be continuously run. And it's because we have an evaporator and you have to push product through the evaporator constantly to evaporate it into extract. But typically, I mean, how we're making your extract is really we're just doing the brewing process. That's all it is. You've got to mash in a louder tun, and then instead of boiling hard, uh, we, because we're, we're not adding hop star extract, uh, we literally just boil to bring it up to temp, and then we send it uh, out through the evaporator. We can make 70 million pounds of syrup and extract. Uh, we split time with our food side pretty heavy on this. Uh, we have large customers that take our extracts uh, on the food side, so think like General Mills and that type of thing, Cliff Bar. Um, so they, they require a lot of syrups and extracts for their products. <coughs> so uh, we do have bulk bins right outside our extract plant. We've got a six roller mill that does about 18,000 pounds an hour to, to feed our uh, 500 barrel system. And uh, then it goes into a mash mash tun, which just really just has the agitator on the bottom, and then it gets uh, dropped into a louder tun, right there, and uh, the uh, louder tun actually has a continuous spray up so that the, uh, the filter bed never gets plugged, or it takes a lot uh, 
Uh, I heard swearing there once, and it was 100% rice extract they were trying to make. Um, and uh, that got stuck. That's the only thing that I've ever heard of getting stuck, but it's a, it's a real pain. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, it's a really, really efficient loudering system. Uh, spent grain sent off to a lot of the farmers in the area, and uh, short, work, short work oil, no hops really involved. So, so this is where, uh, this is the uh, device that makes your liquid gold extract, and it's a six stage falling film of that, uh, vacuum evaporator. This is not a high temperature evaporator. Because it's in a vacuum, we're able to actually keep the work boiling at around 160 degrees. Um, and that temperature actually falls throughout the entire process to about 104. And at 104, we're still pulling off water. So uh, it, it literally, it, it works a lot like a, a distillation unit, um, back to back to back to back to back. So, uh, and very gently. Uh, so uh, one thing about this unit, and one reason why we run 24 hours a day is we have the demand for it, but uh, this unit is about as big as our brew house, and we literally just have to use pressure in the vacuum to continually move product through. So our products bump into each other, and there's a cut that's lost on every single product um, just to keep this machine running. Of course, it's a very low percentage, and of course, we always try to run similar products next to similar products. But uh, if the evaporator goes down, uh, we literally almost have to make a charge batch to get it back up and running something to send through that's gonna get wasted uh, at some point, um, or a larger portion will be wasted. <clears throat> From there, if you're uh, using our GME, it goes to a filter mat spray dryer. Uh, also one of the uh, better spray dryers you can use because it's, uh, it's, it literally just uses the air to dry the product. It breaks down the particles into such a fine particle that the second it hits the air, the water evaporates from the product, and it just sprinkles down like it's Christmas. Um, so, except it's not a, not like snow. You wouldn't want to be standing under these sprayers. Uh, if you handle, handle DME at all, you know, uh, maybe worse than being tarred and feathered. Uh, so, uh, malt drops down. Tiny little partic particulates actually gather, uh, and the, we keep heat going in the unit. It's like a constant furnace in there, and it actually makes a bed of dry malt extract and it's spongy and um, from there it actually has to get dropped down through the heat and milled back into a particulate um, because it pretty much freezes back up right when it lands um, but because there's no moisture it's really easy to, to mill it up right at that point uh, as somebody who had owned a shop in new orleans you know you can cut a bag open and eight hours later it's no longer a dry malt extract product um, it's just a block, and uh, it gets gets pretty ugly. So, uh, so we do have a, a specialized mill there that uh, makes doesn't allow any moisture in, and it keeps the dust uh, uh, in there. You can you can see it's all all done enclosed in a tube. All right, so that kind of really talks you through a lot of uh, you know our uh, our facilities and uh, our process. And uh, I kind of wanted to talk about some new products and uh, what's out now and coming soon. Um, some stuff that you may have seen, <coughs> excuse me, would be some of the new smoke malts that we have out. Uh, we've got a mesquite and applewood out. Um, the mesquite malt is actually extremely aromatic and sits back even further in your beer than our standard cherrywood smoke. It is one of my favorite smoke malts of all time, period. I love it. Uh, a lot of people are scared of it because it says mesquite, and mesquite does have a very strong flavor. Uh, but this one really has a very natural smoke flavor that sits back in the beer. Applewood, extremely fruity, strong smoke. Um, Applewood and mesquite have really both taken off, taken off the craft distillers. Uh, a lot of the smoked whiskeys that are getting made with both of those have been winning a lot of awards. Uh, so that's. That's kind of the main market, but uh, you know, homebrewers like to play, so there you go. Uh, I don't know if smoke will ever be as popular as IPA or uh, sour. <laughs> uh, definitely more of an acquired taste, uh, but maybe we'll get there. Uh, Caramel Rye 60. Uh, 
came out with this Carmel Ride last year, really wasn't launched until this year. Um, there's a lot of different Carmel Rides on the market, actually. There's a Thomas Fawcett, that I believe you can get through CMG and Brewcraft, possibly, and uh, Weirman has one on the market. And uh, we, we decided to play around with this one a bit and uh, come in at the color that we thought was uh, really where the flavor settled in the most. At 60, oh, we started losing some of the spice to the ride, though. It started getting more of a rye bread flavor. So if you're really looking to make a, a rye pale ale, a rye IPA, or a rye any beer, you're still going to want to add a little rye in. But the, the soft caramel and the flavor of this malt is just fantastic. Uh, like I said, sort of rye bread and uh, sweet. Um, really nice, uh, really nice malt. Uh, our pale ale and Vienna liquid malt extracts um, answered a few questions out there, actually about a couple, uh, a couple of these products. Um, these are 100% single varietal extracts. Our pale ale just uses our pale ale malt. Our Vienna just uses our Vienna malt. Uh, our Vienna extract is probably the best way for your customers to be making an Oktoberfest. Uh, any sort of, sort of Munich lager. Um, it was really difficult to, to nail any Vienna-based beer uh, prior to this extract for the extract crowd. Uh, but this, both of these malts are, are phenomenal uh, malts of pale ale. Excellent choice for ales. Comes in a little darker than our Brewer's Malt, which goes into our Golden Light. So this is a couple Lava Bond darker than Golden Light. Um, so if you're making an amber, or brown, or porter, or stout, uh, if you want to just do a single extract, uh, beer, I recommend this pale though. It's got a lot of body and a lot of flavor. It's very, very good. Um, smash brewing with our pale oil grain is a great idea. You can actually smash brew with this pale ale extract uh, and make really good beers. Really a great way to experiment with new hops and new specialty malts. Definitely go with that pale ale extract. Um, save yourself a little time. Uh, Caracol's Red 30 L, this is uh, going to be coming out next year. It hasn't launched yet. Um, this one's got sort of a funny history. We're not, we're not, a, we're not a always bleeding edge as far as products are concerned. Uh, this one was an interesting one that just sort of fell in our lap. We were uh, looking at um, a contract with an extremely large brewer. And we couldn't handle it, we're too small. Um, but they came to us with a couple recipes, and we're like, oh, that sounds like our pear pills, except darker. Let's make that anyway, you know, just to see what happens if they're using it in one of their most popular beers. Um, and uh, so we made this care pills red, and we're like, holy crap, uh, this is good. Uh, so uh, adds ruby red hues, add just a, a pinch of uh, chocolate, roasted barley, midnight wheat, just like you would in any red recipe to really bring the uh, red color up, and it gets ruby red. Um, so uh, it's going to be a different type of red malt that's out there. I'll, I'll put the disclaimer on it that most red malts that you see that are sold as red malts are much lighter than this color. Um, coming in at 30L, we're a little darker, so it doesn't take a lot to push us into red territory. Uh, you can actually use about 10 to 15 percent, you get sort of a, a light garnet color in your beer. Um, if you use 10 to 15 percent, you will have a very, very big body beer. Um, really good head retention and a lot of mouthfeel. It's kind of like Caracol's, but in my personal sensory notes, I said it was sort of Caracol's on steroids. Like you get a lot of body, a lot of mouthfeel, and good head retention. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, just keep in mind when you, when you see this one hit the market that it's coming in a little darker than some other red malts that you might have in there. Uh, from our sensory panel notes, we also had a, a slight almond and toffee flavor in there as well. It's a really, uh, it's a really easy malt to build off of. Really easy malt to, it doesn't get in the way. It just adds something really warm and really uh, uh, sort of round and caramely to you. So uh, this is coming out actually as we speak. Um, for any of you that 
we're stocking growlers in your shop. I, I do apologize. The growler, uh, the growler was a tricky one for us. We did not actually have a good way to package it. It was a very antiquated product for us. It had been out forever. Um, and uh, it cost us a lot to make. Um, so we're coming out with this 30 pound CBW liquid malt extract mini pail. And actually all 11 flavors of CBW will be available in this pail by the end of next year. Through the first quarter of 2017, we'll have all of our standard flavors in there. It's gonna be golden light, pilsen light, amber, dark, wheat. Uh, pale ale will be in, will be added pretty quick. And then you'll also see rye, special dark, uh, porter, uh, and Munich in there as well. So, uh, so it's got four spout on the lid. It's a little guy, just a little 30 pound pail. Um, it's gonna look great on your shelf. It's gonna mimic the canisters. So it's not gonna just be an industrial looking pail. Um, and uh, it's, it's got all the information that our canisters have on it. Um, it's got uh, volume demarcations on the side, so it's a reusable pail. You can pop the, uh, you can pop the pour spout out and put a stopper in there uh, if you wanna do small batches. This is great for folks that are brewing a lot of extract beers as well. Uh, multiple batches. Uh, one, one nice thing to mention is that, uh, and a lot of people do ask me this question, if I want to store extract for a long time, what should I do? Freeze it. You can freeze extract. Right? It's, it takes up a lot of space, I know, because you know, a lot of you guys maybe just have a small fridge freezer or a chest freezer, but um, you can freeze it. The only thing to be aware of when you freeze extract is that when you bring it back up to room temperature, some of the water is gonna come out. How mold forms on extract is because that water creates a film on top of your extract, and that gives bacteria a chance to grow. Bacteria can't grow in extract. It's too dense. What it does grow on is all of the moisture around your lid, uh, on the sides, and on top of your mold. Um, so if you're pulling it out of the freezer, if you're bringing it up to room temperature, take what you need and freeze it again. Um, you, have, you almost have to at that point because uh, you know, as it comes up to temp, you're gonna get uh, some water coming out of that extract, so. We'll be coming out with a new bag as well, so there won't be too many more paper bags on the market. Uh, this is actually running right now. We actually do have new product going into our new bags right now as I speak. Um, so you'll start seeing these uh, replacing the paper bags and through the rest of the year, you may see some commingled product in paper bags and plastic. Number five recyclable, tear strip on the top. Uh, it's gonna be a 50 pound size, we didn't move up to a 55. Uh, and you can, you can cut it. Uh, I think it's gonna be similar to GWM's in the sense that the, uh, the plastic weave is extremely tight. Think like dog food, chicken feed bag where uh, you're not gonna get all those little strips floating around. Uh, you, can, you can make a nice clean cut on the side of the bag. Uh, if you don't want to deal with the tear strip on the top. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, so we do have some new varietal based malts. We do have full plant brewer's malt that's currently out right now. Uh, one malt variety that we planted last year and started playing around with pretty, pretty heavily was uh, Synergy. And Synergy is a uh, newer malt from Canada. We found that the flavors we were getting in our growing region in Wyoming and Montana, uh, kind of changed the game with this malt. It was uh, it was awesome. So uh, the Synergy Pilsen, um, very old world. I mean, think German lagers. Uh, very big, very round, very robust Pilsner malt. We decided to segregate this malt out and start its own line with both Pilsen and Brewers. The Brewers uh, is a slightly sweeter version of our Brewers malt. Um, I'd say there's a little less grain flavor in it, also kind of round. Um, one reason why they got a little round is that they don't color very fast in the multi process. So you can leave them in the kiln a while and it develops flavor without a lot of color. Um, so, so that's really fun. Uh, our monsters are having a good time with the Synergy. It's a really good malt. Well, you're going to see us start to segregate out more varietals just because we can. We have the guys growing whatever we want. We've got the bin space for it now. We're gonna start playing around a lot. 
Uh, we also work with AMPA, which is the American Malty Barley Association. Uh, we serve on the board, or we have Brees folks that serve on the board. Um, many Brees folks are members, and so they kind of determine what the malting varieties that are coming up are going to be, uh, coming out of Oregon State and NDSU and other growing programs around the country. Um, and we get to plant little plots and trial that. And uh, so we always have little trial plots going as well. And uh, it gives us kind of a leg up. We get to really play around a lot with a lot of the new varieties. Um, but, you know, Talk to me, drop me an email, give me a call, whatever you want to see. If you want to see more materials for your store, it'd actually be great if you emailed me that, <laughs> um, because then I have a reason to come to the folks that, uh, that uh, can help make that happen and say, hey, look, uh, folks are asking for it. And that includes all of these items on here. Um, if you're looking for events, talk to other homebrew shops or clubs in your area and uh, I myself or somebody else, we can we can work it into our travel schedule uh, for sure, and we can present on the company or products or malting or uh, whatever you're looking uh, to talk about. We're always working on new malts, extracts, and packaging. But since you guys are frontline, I'd love the feedback from you guys as to what uh, you need to fill your catalogs and what people are asking for. Uh, you know how. You can trickle that up through Rootcraft or trickle that, I'll trickle that down for me all as well. Um, especially if there's products maybe from Reese that uh, you aren't seeing available to you at the homebrew level, um, just let me know. Uh, and then just a little plug at the bottom there for myself. Uh, I'm going to be doing an advanced extract course and an advanced specialty malt course for Brew Your Own Magazine's first BY boot camp. <laughs> Uh, that they're doing on the brewing side. They've done it on the wine side. Uh, out in Burlington, Vermont, this November, and then in Santa Rosa, California, in uh, February. And uh, I'd actually say my classes are probably two of the most boring. There's some good classes. <laughs> so um, definitely look into those director customers there. Uh, you know, Chris White from White Labs is giving talks on yeast and all that stuff. And uh, hot folks are coming in, and it, it'll be a good time. Um, also in uh, 2017, I'm starting to, to, I'll be the BYO Techniques column guy, so I get to write more regularly. I, uh, last two years, uh, those uh, Brew Your Own Reese recipe cards, last couple years I've been writing those recipes, so you can come and complain to me if you have issues with those. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, if you ever are looking, if there's something you, you want to see put into Brew Your Own Magazine, they pretty much just said techniques is their most wide open column, so uh, I can talk about whatever you want. So uh, I think that's all I've got. <laughs>